Good morning, and welcome back to the National Government Ethics Virtual Summit. I'm Patrick Shepard. And I'm Ryan Segrist, and we have a very interesting presentation for you here today. And Ryan, what are we going to be discussing today? Today, Patrick, we're going to be discussing how to brief senior leaders at your agency about your ethics program. And I think that's really important, and uh, it's something that uh, tends to get uh, be a bit of an afterthought when we are conducting these kinds of trainings. Uh, this past month, we've spent a lot of time talking about the specifics of the ethics laws and regulations. We did an elemental analysis of the conflict of interest statute. We did an elemental analysis and some practice around subpart E of the standards. We spent two full days talking about the gifts regulations. Mm -hmm. And all that's really important to us as ethics officials uh, in our day-to-day -day work, when we're advising employees, when we're conducting financial disclosure reviews, when we're drafting ethics opinions. But if we're not able to translate those concepts into work that protects the, the, the agency's programs and operations, it's not nearly as effective as it can be. We can be the most knowledgeable ethics officials when it comes to the regulations, but if we can't turn that into action at our agencies, it's all sort of for naught. That's right. The, the, one of the most important things that uh, we want to communicate to you as part of uh, the virtual summit is that if you can't communicate why the ethics program is important and how the ethics program is there to support the needs of the agency and to support the needs of your senior officials, then you might as well just not do it. So we're going to be talking today about briefing leaders in our agency. And when we talk about leaders, who do we mean? So I think, Patrick, what it sounds like you're saying when you say senior leader is uh, anybody from the supervisor level on up, but in particular, uh, your senior executive types, your uh, obviously your agency head right. uh, is going to qualify as that. But those who are very uh, involved in the direction of the, where the agency is going to go and how it's going to complete its programs. That's exactly right. And I, I think we want to be very careful to include our first-line supervisors. In some cases, our first-line supervisors, or actually in many ways, our first-line supervisors are some of the most important players in our ethics programs. They're very likely to see more ethics questions than you as an ethics official. Their employees are very likely to ask them first. If there's an issue, they're probably the people in the best place to spot those issues. And why is that, Patrick? Well, because they're the people who are on the ground doing the work. Uh, they see the work that their employees are doing, and also the people who have the most frequent contact as an authority figure in the agency with their employees. That's right. They have a situational awareness of the context that they work in that you as an ethics official, particularly at a large agency, may not have. Right. And they also have uh, direct relationships with their subordinates. Mm -hmm. So if they have questions or concerns, they're likely to bring it to, to a supervisor or their boss before they come to you. So it's very important to us as ethics officials that those folks be on board and understand what their role is in the ethics program. And I think it's important for them to understand that their role goes beyond simply abiding personally by the rules and regulations, that they actually play a role on behalf of the agency as spotters of issues, as directors of questions, and those sorts of functions. They, that's right, Patrick. They also are an in, in, integral part of protecting the agency's processes and programs. And so what we'd like to do this morning is share with you some approaches that you can take to planning your briefings with your senior officials. That's those folks from the supervisory level all the way up to the agency head to make the ethics program and the ethics principles both relevant and contextual to those people. We spend a lot of time in training about training, talking about relevance and context. And the reason we do that is because people come into leadership positions in the government not to help you run your ethics programs. Those people have specific work and specific tasks that they'd like to accomplish in their careers, and they're usually tied to the mission of the agency, unless they work in the ethics office, of course. That's right. So it's important for us as ethics officials to understand their work motivations, what they're trying to accomplish in their careers at the agency. Right. So when you have, for example, a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed uh, person who comes in, they're going to have a specific agenda of things that they want to accomplish during their tenure uh, at that agency because it's a limited time. Right. And they're going to want to get right to work on those things. Right. And it's important for us to understand their priorities. If we want to make our training relevant and contextual to them, the things that are most relevant to them are the mission area objectives that they have within the agency. And it's our challenge to make the ethics program and compliance in general and risk mitigation within our organizations relevant and contextual to those specific objectives. That's right, because the 
just saying that the ethics program needs to be complied with, just saying that there are a bunch, a bunch of boxes to tick uh, is, is not going to be enough. It's not going to go far enough to protect those mission area objectives and could, in fact, if, uh, if more is not done, could bog down the uh, completion of those. Okay. So we have some tools that we're going to be talking about today, right, Ryan? We have uh, some ethics activity planning sheet and uh, what is the other one? The training have? strategy worksheet. The training strategy worksheet. And before we take a look at these, I want to talk a little bit about what these are for, what they help us to do. And what they help us to do is to present ethics in the context of the mission of our agencies. That's really what we're getting at. So we start with who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. I know who, it is, who is it that we're going to be briefing? And when we understand who we're going to be briefing, we can begin to understand what work is important to them, what things are important Should to them. Should I bring this up so that people can see it? Um, yeah, let's take a look at uh, the training strategy worksheet first. Sure. Give me just a second to share sure. this. There we go. Uh, so you can see here on your screen, uh, we've provided you with a training strategy worksheet. Um, and this is a tool that we use when developing training for employees that I find to be really, really effective. Because oftentimes when we're developing training for any group of employees, the tendency is to begin with PowerPoint. That's right. We're going to make a PowerPoint. Or whatever software platform you use to create slide decks. Mm -hmm. um, you say, well, I need to make a presentation. I need to make a training. So I'm going to go to the software platform that makes training. And I'm mm -hmm. going to set to work making some bullet points. And that kind of short changes the process. It, it kind of makes the process entirely backwards, frankly. And it... What we want you to do with these training planning worksheets is to take the time to think about what it is you're trying to accomplish with your ethics education. And the other thing that I tend to see with ethics officials, and I've done this myself, and I, I realize it's not the right thing to do, is to begin with the rules. I say, which rules would I like to train on this year? And that also is a, a little bit of a backwards approach. It's starting with the ethics program rather than with the mission of the agency. So the reason we have this worksheet is to help you think differently about how you develop your briefings and match your presentation to the needs of your audience. And the first step in doing that is to identify the audience. But even before that, we've asked you to do something else. Here, what we'd like you to do is create an ethics education mission statement, an overall purpose for why you conduct ethics education in your agency. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is the business change that you want this training to accomplish? What is it that you want your senior leaders and your employees to do or be able to do after they have consumed your training? That's, that's right. So when we talk about training, we talk about changing behavior. So what are the behaviors that you want to realize? What is it that you want to accomplish within the framework of the organization with the training? Uh, not what do you want to have talked about, not which are the objectives in the uh, ethics regulations that you right. want to tick. Not, yeah, wh not which boxes that you tick so that you're done for the year. Yeah, what, what is the mission of the training campaign mm -hmm. or this particular briefing? Oftentimes we have very specific briefings, like with senior leaders, we often have an initial ethics briefing. So what is the mission of our ethics education? And maybe we could brainstorm here, Ryan, briefly some possible mission statements depending on what kind of training campaign we are putting together. So let's take for a minute, since we're talking about training for senior leaders, let's imagine that we're providing some new entrant briefings and some uh, annual briefings for our senior leadership team, that we're going to be doing a number of different briefings. What might be uh, a mission of that training? Well, I think maybe one of them would be to find out what those folks are here to actually do. Just because you are in a training environment doesn't mean that you can't also learn from the people who you are ostensibly training. Okay, so we want to understand what work is planned in our organization over the next time period. It might be a quarter, it might be six months, it might be a year. And we want to understand how the ethics program can support and protect those missions. That's right. Okay, so let's say we, maybe we could posit this as an ethics education mission statement. We want to collaborate with senior leaders in our organization to understand what work we have uh, made a priority for the next year and understand how the ethics programs can support those missions. That sounds like a pretty good one to me. And maybe the, some strategies that we can use to work together to ensure the protection of, of that work. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, but I think it's important, and it's a nice way to start, actually. If, if you walk into the briefing, this is a, if you're using a slide deck, this is not a bad thing to have at the top of your slide deck or the top of your meeting agenda. What I'm here to do today is to understand what you'd like to do over the next quarter, six months, or year, and help us come to an agreement or understanding of how we can work together to make sure that those uh, pieces of the mission are protected uh, from reputational risk. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's step one, is mm -hmm. to figure out what the mission of our training campaign is. Uh, the mission of the training campaign is not to satisfy the training rec. The training regulation is an instrument uh, that helps us think about training. Uh, mm -hmm. It requires us to do something. But it is itself, it's, it's not in a position to know what's necessary for your organization. Right. Uh, only you in cooperation with your agency leadership and other employees can decide what kind of ethics training is required. Um, so it's a starting point, but it's not an ending point. And merely getting to the starting line is not the same thing as running an effective training program. That's right. So what we want to do is set full objectives, a mission within our agency for our education program. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing we want to do, if, if our goal is to create uh, an understanding between leadership and the ethics office about what the work is going to be for the next little while and how we can work together to the, protect the integrity of that work, we have to figure out who it is we need to talk to. Right. We need to, the, that's why this is the second thing that is on our training strategy worksheet is audience. We need to know who we're going to be talking to, who we need to talk to. Uh, and we need to know a little bit about, you know, where they're positioned uh, within the agency, what it is that these folks uh, do, what purpose they serve, and also if they have any kind of special characteristics. For, for example, those of you who are out there at, uh, you know, various science agencies uh, who are dealing with scientists a lot, you may groan now, uh, <laughs> But those of you who are dealing with scientists versus dealing with contract officers versus dealing with senior executives, those are three very different audiences with very different needs. And our list of audiences might change as we pursue the mission. Mm -hmm. So if our mission is to understand the work that our agency is going to do over the next quarter and find a way for the ethics office to cooperate with the program offices to protect the integrity of that work, as we learn more, we might have to add audiences to our list. Uh, say, for example, you work in an agency like ours that doesn't do a great deal of procurement but you find that in the next quarter, a uh, major procurement activity is going to take place. We might have a new universe of folks we need to talk to in order to protect the integrity of that program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we might have a number of audiences. Today we're talking specifically about leaders, uh, so everyone from our line employees to our agency head. Can I interject just briefly, Patrick? Of course. Uh, for those of you who uh, follow us regularly on our, on our online distance learning events, uh, you can find these two worksheets uh, in the IEG store. Yes, you can. And also, we are going to post this uh, online on the Watch Now page, along with all of the other materials for the virtual uh, summit. Yes. Sorry, I want to, in, in case people were looking for these, you will find them. No, that's, that's, that's a very good point, because these are meant to be used. Uh, we didn't right. create these just for the presentation. These are actual tools that you can use to help yourself in your programs. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. So let's say provisionally that our audience are the new senior executives at our agency. Uh, we have the mission statement, which is to protect the integrity of the work that we're going to be doing over the next little while. Mm -hmm. And now we need some strategic goals. Um, and in order to have those strategic goals, we're going to have to understand what it is that's going on. So in fact, our first strategic goal might be learn what kind of work we have planned for the next quarter or six months or fiscal year. And then we might have some other strategic goals. Th these might be areas where we need those folks to understand what services we can provide to help them maintain the integrity of their programs and operations. Right. And we might even go so far as to think about the things that we want them to be able to do afterwards. What is, what is the kind of behavior uh, that we would like them to engage in after receiving uh, training from us? Yeah, and I think this is one area where starting with the work can be very effective. Because when you understand what kinds of activities are going to be taking place, you can begin to sensitize managers and leaders to the kinds of issues that that work is likely to produce. So for example, if we go back to our procurement example, we know that there are specific kinds of issues that are of particular concern uh, surrounding procurements. Mm -hmm. We're concerned with impartiality. We're concerned with conflicts of interest. We are concerned with compliance with the various acquisition rules. And we can make them aware of that. We can say, I see that you, are, you intend to engage in a procurement activity. Here are the things that you should be aware of. So our strategic goal might be that they can spot issues related to the major activities taking place in their organizations. 
And beyond that, that when they spot an issue, they know what to do. Right, right. Whether whether that is going so far as to be very specific about what they can do, yes. or whether if they just have kind of a funny feeling about something, that they know who to call if they need some advice on it. Right. And I think this is another place where starting with the work can be very effective. So we can go back to the procurement example, and we, we'll talk about some other examples in a few minutes. It might be very helpful if you know that a procurement is coming up to take another look at the financial disclosure reports of those people involved in that activity. It might be very helpful to provide briefings uh, to people who are on the source selection committee right before they begin the briefing because the timing of training has been shown in research to be very, very important. The two things that affect the usefulness of your training to employees and to your organization are one, the timing of the training, and two, the relevance of the training to the work. So if you're starting with the work, you can make your training and ethics interventions both relevant, contextual, and timely for your employees. So in the case of a, a procurement, you could provide a staff briefing to the office involved immediately before they start at relevant milestones throughout the process. Mm -hmm. You can conduct your financial disclosure review uh, at the beginning of that process to make sure that you don't have any conflicts that were missed during the annual cycle. There are lots of strategies that you can adopt when you know what kind of work is going on. That's right. And, and I just want to hit on the timeliness side of that again. Uh, the, the studies have shown that the timeliness is so important that it, the, the training uh, content isn't even necessarily as important uh, compared to the timeliness of it. So if you, uh, to use a procurement example, using those milestones as a way to, you know, every, it, every milestone, it doesn't have to be a super long involved training. Just a reminder that there are ethical standards and we want to protect the processes and integrity of our, our, of our program is going to be very, very effective. Uh, for not all that much investment in time. So I can hear the question coming, and even though we're not taking questions today, there are too many people on, on the call, and that is, well, there are only three of us in my office, and we have thousands of employees. How do we have time to provide briefings on every major initiative and keep up with this stuff? Well, we got to be creative with it. And I think that that's part of it. Uh, but the other part of it is that assumes that the resource question is a fixed point. Mm -hmm. And it assumes that we can't multiply our efforts through the ability of others. And this is, again, a point that we like to emphasize when we're talking about leadership, which is that with the assistance of agency leaders and frontline supervisors, they have the capacity to multiply our reach. We mentioned before that supervisors are likely to be the first people that employees come to when they have a potential issue. And supervisors are also the folks who are most able to spot issues. So one of the objectives that we might have when we're briefing supervisors, frontline supervisors, is to sensitize them of areas and points in time that they might run into ethics concerns and either give them strategies to address that personally or give them resources or access to resources that can help them. Uh, so they can sort of be your eyes and ears on the ground and mm -hmm. you can also empower them with some tools to help address these things. So if right. you have a briefing paper on potential procurement concerns, you can provide that to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before you begin, it might be a good idea to hand this to your staff. Uh, here are some tools. Here's a section on our website where we have a self-help guide that employees can, can check to see if they have potential appearance concerns. You can provide them resources that can help you to manage that, and they can help you with the timeliness, but they have to understand where the issues are and when an intervention would be timely. Right. So they have to know at what point in the procurement process is it important to think about potential conflicts of interest. Additionally, this isn't a new concept when we look at the ethics program. Many agencies employ supervisors in the processing and review of confidential financial disclosure reports. This is an example where OG has made explicit a way for supervisors to help us with ethics interventions and ethics training. But there are, um, you know, there are many other ways that you can uh, affect a, a similar a similar outcome. That's right. And if you've got, uh, as you said, if you've got uh, thousands of employees and there's only three of you, uh, you're going to need the help. You're going to need the help exactly. And and all of your frontline supervisors are, if you can get them to understand where the issues are and be able to spot where the issues might come up. Right. Uh, even if they, 
even if they don't know the the rules as perfect as you do, if they know if they know when they get that weird feeling that something isn't quite right, then uh, and they call you and ask you for your advice, and you're already much further ahead than you were before. So yeah, so that's a very significant and I think important strategic goal is to have our leaders and supervisors understand and be able to spot issues that are likely to arise in the work that they have planned. Mm -hmm. Another note on resources is that oftentimes as an ethics office we are resource constrained. You know, resources are never limitless. We're never going to have enough to manage all of the risks all of the time. By beginning with the work and the risks associated with the work, it makes it easier for us to make the case that we maybe need more resources. Or it makes it easier for the organization to assess the effectiveness of the resources. Right. And it also it also allows us to prioritize our risk. Right. And make determinations about what level of risk mitigation is appropriate to the risks that we've identified. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're starting with the work for the next quarter and we identify a basket of procurements, some regulatory actions, um, maybe there's going to be a reorganization of another office. So there's a lot of things ongoing. Mm -hmm. And once we've identified those important activities, we can start thinking about the ethics risks. And we can start to articulate those to our agency leaders and supervisors. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at our resources and say, what do we have available? What strategies do we have collectively to manage those? And in the case of some of the smaller procurements, maybe we decide that the supervisor for that program office is going to distribute some resources or tools to the implied some timely reminders. We may decide with some of those bigger issues that we're going to have in-person briefings via ethics officials. And we can agree as an organization on a plan for managing the organization's risks. Uh, so the conversation becomes about managing the work for the agency, not about how the ethics office ticks all the boxes that it needs to tick. Right. And I think that's an important change in focus. And it starts with our beginning, which is starting with the work, starting with the mission of the agency and showing how the ethics office can support the agency. And I think that, that, that showing how the ethics office can support the agency is, is an important point because oftentimes uh, I have seen ethics officials seeing you know their jobs as something that is separate, yes. not, not in support of. Bolted right. on to the, the side. And it's, it's always going to be difficult to be effective if that's the way you view your role and the organization views your work. Mm -hmm. And one of the big the biggest steps that you can take to bridge that gap is by understanding the work that the agency is trying to accomplish and starting your conversation there. The other thing, once we have an understanding of what steps we're going to take to mitigate the risk of the major work efforts that we're uh, undertaking, we can decide whether or not those are sufficient. And it's interesting to see this change in agencies over time. It's often on the, from a prospective uh, position, agencies are often quite conservative in the allocation of ethics resources. Mm -hmm. And I mean conservative, and they don't spend a lot of ethics resources right? until something goes wrong. And then they decide that... And then it, it is overkill. The, or, or that you know, the, the, the resources we need to mitigate this problem, we don't care how many resources it takes, this yeah. problem is not going to be realized again. Mm -hmm. A good example of this, I've seen this at uh, probably a half dozen agencies now, is the pre-vetting of new hires for potential conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. And it only takes one or two critically placed employees who you hire who are irreparably conflict conflicted out of their jobs for an organization to decide, let's not ever do that again. We'll make the resources available to ensure that there is a proper vetting of new employees. Right. Uh, but normally that doesn't happen until there's been a problem. But by having the conversation and talking about the risks in terms of mission and effectiveness, we can maybe have some of those conversations before there's a problem and come to an agreement about what the appropriate level of resourcing is to mitigate those risks. Which is a great place to be in because what are we doing as ethics officials? We, we serve a prophylactic and preventative. That's right. Uh, th th that is what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't run around and try and fix things afterwards. We try and protect the agency from reputational risk uh, before any of that risk, ha uh, before any of the, the bad things might occur. Right. And if you're talking to a senior leader, you're saying, senior leader, I understand that you want to accomplish these five things. I see the following risks that are inherent in that work, and I suggest the following strategies to mitigate that risk. I would strongly advise you to have more than one strategy. Uh, have a very high resource strategy, something that would almost completely or as completely as possible manage the risk. Uh, you might also think about a strategy that would significantly mitigate the risk. Uh, but it's resource intensive. So if we're talking about the procurement, in a perfect world, we'd have an ethics official review all of the financial disclosure reports of the folks who are on the procurement team right before they begin the procurement. 
and also brief them and before al- it happens and through the brief milestones. Them in small groups and maybe yeah. individually if more counseling is required, et cetera, for every procurement that the agency does. That's obviously not practical right. in an agency that's very large that does a lot of procurement. Mm-hmm. So we have to come up with some strategies that are maybe less perfect but uh, can also be effective. Things like having supervisors provide reminders about the resources available, reminders about the rule, have supervisors involved in the financial disclosure review process. These are all other strategies, but I'd strongly recommend that you have a spectrum of strategies available that you can bring to the table and say, look, here's the risk. Uh, We we understand that we agree upon it as an organization. Uh, Here are some available strategies. How sensitive do we think this is? How important is it that we mitigate the risk? And, you know, frankly, what resources do we have available to do that? What's reasonable within the resourcing that we have available? Right. And if everyone's on the same page, uh, you can accept the risk and move on. And this isn't just OGE saying this. Uh, The Office of Management and Budget recently updated their A11 circular, which is sort of the guideline for agencies management plans. So it's how to manage an executive branch agency. That's right. And there's a new thing in there. There's a new thing in there. Uh, Each agency is now required to have a chief risk officer that manages not just ethics risk, but all risk. Mm -hmm. So if you start speaking the language of risk to programs and operations, it's likely that you'll be understood by someone in the management team. Right. uh, Or you will be very soon. And we asked and OMB complied with our request to add reputational risk to the list of risks that that person will oversee. Right. And this is where you guys come in as ethics officials. Reputational risk is something within the portfolio of the ethics office. Mm -hmm. And if you can begin your conversation from that perspective, uh, you might find a receptive audience or at least an audience that is familiar. Right. Okay. So we've talked about strategic goals. And we also talked a little bit about how important timing is. Mm Mm-hmm. So the next step is to come up with a schedule. And this, again, might evolve as you go through the process and learn more about the work. That's right. Uh, the schedule can uh, it, it can vary, and it, it, it is necessary sometimes that it, that it be changed uh, when circumstances change. Right. It can, be, it can be flexible, but you still want to have something planned out at the beginning. You want to have a sketch of what you want to get done. You need a starting point. Right. And when we're talking about senior leaders and supervisors, I'd recommend looking into the work planning process that your agency engages in. Mm-hmm and aligning your training schedule with that planning process. If there's a strategic planning review, if there's a way you promulgate your strategic plan, if there's a way you do your performance accountability report, whatever the tools that your agency uses for planning, think about how that can inform your ethics training schedule so that you can talk to people when they're thinking about strategies for the future, when they're thinking about planned work, so that you can make your training relevant to that planning process. That's right, you can bake in the controls before the project even starts. Exactly right. And you can be talking about you can be talking to employees about reputational risk and ethics concerns at the time when they're thinking about planning work and what activities need to go into accomplishing these mission related activities. Right. Cool. Um, and that might evolve. So as we identify the specific work, we may have additional schedules. So this is kind of a living document. Yeah. So the next thing that we're going to want to talk about is the location. And uh, this can be a physical location, it can be an ethereal location, it can be uh, a digital location. However, th- th- this is more of just a logistics point that you want to make sure that you consider, uh, but it's it's something that can also be subject to change. Yeah, and we have to deliver these messages and have these conversations somewhere. Right. We should also think about where is appropriate to mm-hmm. have these conversations and to conduct these briefings. As one of the things that we tend to do is we say, we're going to conduct ethics training. Where is ethics training conducted? Trainings all are conducted in the auditorium. Or in the conference room. Or in the conference room. So we're going to book the auditorium. We're going to set up a bunch of chairs facing the front wall. We're going to set up one chair facing the back wall. I'm going to sit in that one. They're going to sit in this one. I'm going to talk. They're going to listen. If what we're trying to do is understand what work those people find important and have planned and are thinking about and incorporate ourselves into the strategy and the planning of that work, that's maybe not the best approach when it comes to setting up the room or beginning the conversation. Right. Uh, when I was working at an agency, I like to do something that I, I thought to myself as a covert ethics training. Uh, sometimes I'd ask, could I attend your planning meeting so that I could learn some things you know, and understand and maybe provide some input? And it's okay to meet people where they are, where the work's already being conducted. If you can get yourself a few minutes on an agenda of a larger meeting, if you can ask to attend and have a, a line item on the agenda for each piece of work, that's great. Mm-hmm. And when we're talking about briefing leadership, 
we're talking about how they can support the ethics program, but also how the ethics program can support them. And one way you can demonstrate your support is by coming to them, yeah, joining them in their work. The ethics mm -hmm. program is here to support your work. The way we demonstrate this is by joining you in your work. And all, obviously in order to receive these invites, to be invited, uh, you know, you're going to have to build the relationships with these folks and uh, you know, demonstrate the value of the program to them. But that's a consideration for location. Right. And, and just to just to add to that just a little bit, you know, the ethics program can't just be an ivory tower uh, off alone in the wilderness all by itself waiting for something to happen to it. You have to be out. You have to be out in there doing some of the work with them, making sure that they are aware of the reputational risk and coming to them makes it easier. And they're going to be more receptive to you when you do come to them. That's right. So we, we need to physically demonstrate our support of their work mm -hmm. and our feeling that what we do is support the mission of the agency by helping them to manage ethics and reputational risk. And we should consider that mission when we select locations. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're talking about briefing senior leaders, find a way to make it conversational. Find a way to either provide input to the processes that they're already engaged in or at the very least provide them comfortable mechanisms to provide you information about the ethics concepts you're discussing. Right. And so it's only now that we get to the methodology or how we're going to do this. So it's, it's this, only now that we get to, is, this, is it going to be a PowerPoint or This not? is where we decide whether or not we should have a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay, so we've done all of that thinking and we've laid out our strategic goals. We've created our uh, initial schedule. We've thought about location and setup. And you see why this is, why, this is where we put methodology. And the reason that we put methodology right here at the end is because if you've decided that the place you're going to conduct this briefing is in the quarterly planning meeting that your senior executives hold, there might not be a PowerPoint presentation available. You mm -hmm. might not have a screen. You might not have a place for lecture notes. Uh, you may need handouts. You may need uh, just a, a number of bullet points. Mm -hmm. You may not be sure exactly what you're going to brief on, so you want to bring your statutes and regs and uh, an agile mind. That's right. You want to make sure that you are well caffeinated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, those are, those are in, important categories for us, and the methodology really does follow all of that planning and objective work, and is really informed by our decisions about how we can best support the mission and operations of our agency. That's right. All right, so we have another activity planning sheet, don't we, Ryan? Yes, we do. And this is more specific. This is once we've identified the work and the specific agency uh, mission areas or planned work uh, that we can use this to think about a training strategy to address the risks with that piece of work or that mission area. So we call this the ethics activity planning sheet. So where do we start, Ryan? So here, here as before, uh, as you just mentioned, what we're starting with here is identifying any of the planned work or other events that are likely to present ethics issues. And what we mean by that is what, what is the specific thing that is going to be done? What is the strategic objective or project area or specific tasks within that that are going to present reputational risk for us? So another way to say that is what is our agency doing over the next little while? Mm -hmm. And uh, once we pick one of those things out, uh, we could say, let's do a rulemaking this time. Mm -hmm. Say we're going to do a rulemaking that's going to uh, affect an industry. Uh, to steal from the 208 reg, let's say we're going to do a rulemaking about the trucking industry. Okay. So we know that it's a particular matter of general applicability. And yeah. Don't have to reprise that conversation. Mm -hmm. Though if you're interested, on forum day two, our general counsel uh, did join Rob Shapiro and uh, Helen Eisner to discuss this at length. It's a very, uh, very interesting presentation. You can go check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, not what we're talking about today, but a good thing to know about. So let's say we're, we're going to have a rulemaking affecting the, the, the trucking industry. Okay. So we've identified that as a piece of work, as a priority for our senior leadership. It's on our regulatory agenda for the next fiscal year. People which, have been assigned to it. Right, which means it's that we need, happen. we need to assess it for organizational risk at this point. And so what we need to then do is to identify any of the business units or parties that are going to be most closely involved with that. Right. So here we might have a program office or a research office that is driving the substance of the regulation. Uh, we might have some people who are bringing general information from the industry. We might have public affairs folks who are doing outreach to the affected industry. Mm -hmm. We probably also have some folks in our ledger affairs or regulatory affairs department who are going to be involved. Right. But what we want to do there is identify those stakeholders, mm -hmm. figure out who is involved in this process. 
And what is the risk profile for all of those folks? Right, for all of, the, all of those business units, because the next step is to actually drill down into those units and identify even further those positions that are going to be the most critical and the most likely to be uh, affected by a, a measure of reputational risk. So if we had the, the supervisor of the program office that's driving the substance, maybe the supervisor of the rulemaking office that mm -hmm. gives us administrative law support in the rulemaking process, if we have a research office that's uh, providing input, uh, the principal in that office would be important. Right. And we might want to have a chat with those people. If, if there are three principals of the three programs that are working together on this effort, it might be good to start with a conversation with those folks to understand, you know, what's their plan, how do they intend to proceed, uh, so we can begin thinking more about the risks. Well, and not only that, but also to make sure that they're aware of how the ethics office is there to support what it is that they're trying to accomplish and to try and try and get in with them immediately to figure out uh, strategies for making sure that the process is, is clean and, and is done with integrity. Yeah, we could almost jump off from there and go back to the training strategy worksheet and mm -hmm. collectively put together a plan. Yeah, that's one way we could think about doing this. But we want to identify those, those principles involved in this exercise so that we can learn about how they plan to proceed and help them to see where the, the issues might lie. And then the last thing that we want to do is to uh, just talk about what kinds of activities we think would be uh, useful in mitigating that kind of risk. Uh, and when we say that, uh, when we're talking about the activities, we're also talking about, uh, you know, the timeliness of it and right. the specific kinds of situations and individuals that are that are going to be uh, the ones that we want to make sure that we target for this. Yeah, so in our rulemaking process, we may have started during our annual work planning process, our strategic planning process, looking at the regulatory agenda. We found that we are going to have a rulemaking that affects this discrete and identifiable class, which is important to us because we're going to be uh, you know, concerned about conflicts there. We've identified the principles involved in that work. And the first step might be to have a meeting with those people mm -hmm. and begin to understand how they plan to approach this, uh, this work area. And then work with them to decide when and how they need ethics support. Mm -hmm. And that could take the form of staff briefings. We might want to get everyone involved together at the beginning, explain to them the ethics issues that arise. And these are sundry. We have potential conflicts concerns, potential impartiality concerns. We have non-public information concerns. Mm -hmm. We have equality of access concerns. We have financial disclosure reporting concerns. You may have supplemental agency regulations that uh, pr pr uh, produce issues. Right. But we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and understands what those potential concerns are. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but that these are all risks that we need to manage as an organization. We also might want to pull back a little bit and think not from the perspective of the ethics office where the risks lie, but where might the ethics or where might the agency be criticized from the outside through this process? Right. You know, what are the inflection points going to be that create a lot of public interest or stakeholder interest, uh, maybe even conflict, that could adversely affect our ability to complete this work? Mm -hmm. And we can think about how the ethics office and the ethics program and rules can help to mitigate some of those risks. And we can also be prepared for that eventuality. Now, this isn't always about avoiding criticism in all cases. Many times, we can see criticism coming, and we know that the agency is going to be criticized one way or the other, but we've, we've selected a way forward, and there is a stakeholder group that's going to be displeased with the outcome uh, because we're choosing between the best of two options, and sometimes neither of those is perfect. Mm -hmm. But the ethics office can help agencies prepare for that eventuality. We can make sure that the processes have been organized in a fair way, that where we've, uh, where we've identified these issues, the ethics office has been consulted uh, to help the agency decide where the agency's interest lies without bias. Right, and that the, the, uh, the, conduct, of, the conduct of those employees ha, has been overseen by people who are aware of the ethics risks. Exactly right. Um, so you know, perhaps you have an appearance concern or something that could be alleged to be an appearance concern, and you've decided the agency interest outweighs the appearance concern. Having the ethics office involved in that decision, having a written determination, prepares you to deal with any eventual criticism. Mm -hmm. So for example, you had an employee who worked at a stakeholder three or four years ago, five years ago even, and you really need their expertise. And we know there's no covered relationship, but we looked at that and said, you know, that's a circumstance where maybe we could be criticized rightly or wrongly, and we're just going to prepare for it. 
and we're going to write down that we thought about it and write down the factors that led us to believe that this employee should participate on behalf of the government because the government is interested in their participation notwithstanding this outside possibility of the criticism. Mm -hmm. But then if the criticism materializes, being able to produce that document or that uh, deliberative process and say, yeah, we had a process, we thought about it, these are the factors that we weighed and this is the reason that we decided to move forward the way we did, is very helpful and can take something that could be extremely problematic or time consuming and make it a mere inconvenience. Right. So as an ethics official, one of your roles is to help your organization anticipate and manage these uh, reputational concerns. So we've actually covered a, a, a lot of conceptual ground today. We, we have, and I, I, I hope that we've provided some very specific activities because I, I, we realize that these concepts start at a very conceptual level. They start, we're beginning with the idea uh, and we're beginning to talk about <clears throat> what is the role of the ethics official in the organization? And that's a very high level to begin at. But we hope that what we've done is, is maybe change the way you think about that, but also given you some concrete steps that you can take to begin integrating the ethics program into the day-to-day -day work of your organization and to begin both thinking yourself about how you can protect the integrity of the work that your agency does, but also ways that you can help the employees in your agency understand that your role is to help them protect the integrity of the work that they're doing. Right. You're not merely an obstacle with boxes to check. Right. Uh, and I think if there's nothing else that you do as a result of this presentation, spend some time learning about the work that your agency does mm -hmm. and more importantly is planning to do. Find a way to either observe or involve yourself in the work planning processes. Every agency does a strategic planning process. Every agency has to issue a performance accountability report. You know, there are performance measures that we are required to undergo as, as agencies in the executive branch. Learn about those processes and find ways that you can become involved. Uh, find ways that the ethics of office can support those processes and learn about the activities of your agency so that you can frame your services and your training and your briefings in a way that begins with the mission of the agency, that starts with the work and uses the rules and the ethics program as a way to help protect the work. Because that's right. really what it's for. The rules help us to protect the agencies. Right. They're, they're, they're a tool. They are, not, uh, they, they are not a purpose in and of themselves. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they're not an end in and of themselves. That's right. Yes. In, yes. The, in the philosophical parlance, they're, they're instruments. They are not uh, ends in themselves. So right. Compliance with the rules is important because it helps to protect our agencies. And that's what we want people to understand is that these rules, these requirements, are important because they help to protect the agency. Right. The other thing we want them to understand is that they're not sufficient, mm -hmm. that the agency has to exercise good judgment. They have to consult the right people in order to protect the agency. That simply having ticked all of the boxes doesn't mean that you're immune from criticism, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you'll never have an issue. Uh, if you're more interested in this in this topic, I'd suggest uh, the compliance convergence session. Oh, that was a very good Forum session. Day two. Uh, particularly the section that Patrick Kelly delivered from the FBI mm -hmm. about how they manage risk in their organization. And they said they had a huge problem very shortly after getting a glowing review from OGE. They had a compliant ethics program, but they still had a big problem. Right. Uh, they weren't effectively managing the risks in their organization for the organization. So I want you to keep that in mind, that the rules are instruments that help us to protect our organizations. Right. They are, they are for something. They are not the something. Uh, so that it's okay to go beyond those. And it's go okay to have your organization think about activities that it may need to undertake to, to protect the integrity of programs and operations. Right. So I think that's about enough for this morning. Uh, yeah, we have just a couple of announcements real quick. Uh, Here's a reminder that this afternoon at 1 p.m., we're going to be joined by OGE's own Monica Asher to discuss rules that uh, cover non-career employees, yes. which is going to be uh, an interesting and fairly advanced topic. And tomorrow, we're going to be live streaming all day, live at the Federal Housing Finance Agency. That's right. And we're going to be engaging with a lot of outside stakeholders, such as uh, inspectors general, the media, members of Congress, yes. 
the judicial branch. We're going to we're, we're going to be kind of covering the waterfront on this one. Yeah, it should be very exciting. And, and if you found today's presentation to be uh, maybe lacking in specifics of law and policy, uh, Monica's presentation this afternoon is sure to slake your thirst for uh, statutory and regulatory concepts. So That's right. We'll be back in the book looking at the rules, and we do hope you'll join us. Uh, for OG, I'm Patrick Shepard. And I'm Ryan Segrist. Thanks.